battle up, on, you know, up in Nebraska, this battle at San Saba, they, uh, in 17 months later, they, uh, uh, the, the uh, commander of the Presidio Paria, Colonel Paria, decided to chastise the French and the Indians, and he went out with about 1,000, maybe 1,500 men, and they got into a firefight uh, with the same Comanches. It looked like French flags were flying. We don't know what the real, real end of the story was, but the bullets were flying so hard and fast, one Spanish soldier had a saddle horn shot off, his ramrod shot off, shot through the hat, shot twice through the clothing, didn't hit him, and shot, killed his horse. And that was just one man. He said, uh, the, uh, so they had to retreat. As a result of that retreat, it put Texas in a defensive position where there will be no more Spanish expansion. So New Mexico and uh, uh, Texas would find themselves uh, virtually outpowered and out, outmaneuvered by the Plains Indians because of the adaption of the horse and the gun. And it turned the whole Plains upside down, those who were thus equipped and those who weren't co equipped. In, in New Mexico, the Pueblo Indians did not go out buffalo hunting for about 10 years. And when they were asked why, he said the had, Comanches had plenty of guns and they didn't mind using them. <laughs> so they just stayed home, you know. Okay, okay, let's see what else we have here. Uh, so this may be, and I, and I can't, I, I, this very strange story, I went to a massive auction back east, and at the last day there were so many items that they had boxes of stuff you could buy for whatever. And this was in the bottom of a box and it says San Saba, Texas on the tag. And I didn't even think about it until I started putting it together. In the Catholic faith, just because you're killed as a martyr does not make you a saint. And there, in New Mexico, they call that a santo only if it has a halo. And there's no mark, it's just bruised on the head where he'd been beaten by a tomahawk. And I don't know if he was sponsored as a result with uh, Pedro, the wealthy sponsor, Father Tejeros. Or there was another one showing the death of the other priest, Father Tejeros. I don't know, but um, I uh, try to get it in Texas Monthly magazine and no savvy, you know, so because it's a very high water mark, as little as, as it may not appear important in our lives today. It, it was, it's, it's all your heritage. It's all the background of what's going on. So that's the short version. Any quick questions? That's the Nick. We just traveled almost 200 years and across two doggone miserable states, and you guys are wonderful. Any questions at all? Any idea about the paintings or where they ended up or <coughs> any, any thoughts on the subject? I, won't, I, I promise I won't bite. Doug, what do you think? Uh, Go on now, Captain. I don't think you must get it all. <laughs> <laughs> um, where, did, where did you find it? Okay, this is real. The, the, oh, this right here? I, it was in a box at an auction. Where? Oh, in uh, uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me, tell, let me tell you the war story. Uh, there was a, a mayor that went rogue. He spent nine million dollars. He was the mayor of Harrisburg. Uh, there's a reason he had a museum, and uh, they were drawing a million visitors a year and making money. And so he decided to make a museum of the West. And he wore a black cape, very strange dude. He came out. Uh, I was at a Tulsa, Oklahoma gun show, and he bought my entire table. And ten years later, uh, when the airplanes hit the tower, they were looking for a different month. A lot of a lot of things came up. He'd been floating bonds and all this stuff was in the warehouse. Another 10 years later, they decided to sell it as is, was is. And it was a seven day auction from his, his state of about 103 and the humidity is 104. And we, I sat there for seven doggone days. In one of the boxes was a horn bow that I got $25,000 for. And they were, they were put, uh, in these boxes were filled by public workers and just, they, they were the scraps. And I assume he got thrown in there because his legs are gone and he looks pretty beat up, huh? And bloody and who, who'd want to buy that? So, uh, it, so anyhow, it, 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 that may be the only icon, that may be your Sega sort of painting, which is kind of fun, you know, and, 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 and uh, but when, to know your history, it, it develops a platform and makes your days easy. You can watch, well, we, we just heard, how many, how many people did I just kill in the last hour? <laughs> okay, you had a question back there? I was curious, was it the Spaniards that didn't arm their allies? Yeah, the Spanish, it was against the absolute rule to, to give the Apaches, which were the buffer zone. And that's what finally got, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the Apache finally got shoved down on, uh, and compressed because they couldn't fight back. Had the Spanish armed their allies? Yeah, it would have been a whole... Just, 
whole different story. They, they would have held the position, and there was some argument to that effect. In fact, we had to use the Comanches. They, it became so, uh, so compressed with Apaches whirling around the year 1780-90 that uh, De Anza made a, a proposition uh, with, the, with the Comanches to kill Apaches, to, to slow things down. Jim, <laughs> tell yes. us, how did, how did Santa Fe acquire these two paintings? Well, there was a book put out in 1950 by Gottfried Holtz, who did a book called, he's a German, he was the guy who found the paintings, and he said uh, a, a book on curious Indian hide paintings. And a friend of mine who is a PhD, uh, who Tom Chavez, who became the curator at the Palace of the Governors, which is the main historic museum, got wind of it, and then he found out they're for sale, and uh, then it started. It, it, it was you know, raised, We had the Smithsonian trying to beat us up and everything. How much did y'all raise to buy it? Uh, 900000 And it was, a, it was the last... Uh, <laughs> I was traveling by aircraft, and there was a beautiful woman sitting across from me. Well, her hands were beautiful, and I just made a comment. I said, you got the most beautiful hands? And it turns out she was working with war vets. But the guy next to me said, oh, that's the damnedest way I know to meet a woman. It turned out to, <laughs> he, he turned out to be the most powerful senator uh, uh, Les Houston, and, and, and I called him, and he, he, I said, listen, we need some bucks, we're going to lose this national treasure, blah, blah. He said, Hengisbaugh, he, he said, I want you to put a bill in my name for the full amount, but if you're wrong, there's no place on earth you can hide. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the fight started, I got it on national TV, I was pretty good friends on one of my rides, Mike Leonard, who was the old guy who used to work for NBC, um, did a, flew me up to the battle site, and um, it, it, the politics started. The governor was going to veto it. We had to have the full amount. They were going to cut it in half. I had Mike Leonard call the governor and say, how's it going out there, and all this, and we got her through full boat, and <coughs> right at the last minute. And it was just Kentucky wind each other. I just was there at the right time, right spot. Is, is there a formal name to the paint? Yeah, uh, they're, they're called the Segus or Hyde paintings. <coughs> Sagasur, Sagasur, like in Father Sagasur. Yeah. And, and they're called the Sagasur Hyde paintings. Um, Viasur was the lieutenant governor that got caught in the trap we talked about, but they're on display under the Sagasur Hyde paintings. And there's a couple of wonderful books, and you got a standing invite. I'll leave, uh, you can get through the museum curator. If any of you come to Santa Fe, I'll give you, show you where the best green chili is, but I'll give you a tour <laughs> and run you by my plunder just in case. You, you, you know. uh, and and, and uh, we'll take you down to the museum, show you around the museum. You wouldn't be here if you didn't love what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. But they are spectacular. Now, the trouble is, it would be like we had all the people of Valley Forge. Um, half the people are still in town. Uh, Thomas Olguin, the master of camp, that said, uh, um, I recommend you keep traveling, and he was accused of having fear. Uh, I was burning my eyes trying to study the, the, uh, the painting. I go outside, and there's a truck goes by that says, Thomas Olguin, exterminating service. His family still there. So, you know, I'm showing sure the houses where some of these people, I mean, it's right and raw. I mean, it's right there, you know? Where is the painting now? It, it's at the Palace of the Governor's Museum. <coughs> Segus or one. Where, where, where is that? Oh, I'm in downtown Santa Fe. Okay. I thought everybody knows. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Segus or one is about an expedition. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, painting, also not as big as this one, but it shows a, uh, an expedition going out into the plains to recover Pueblo Indians that had run out in 1680 during the Pueblo Revolt and didn't want to face the Spanish. Now the governor wanted to bring him back so he could tax him. And it shows this incredible man. The entire horse is covered in rawhide. It looks like Richard III, what they call it a bard, B-A-R-D. That horse is covered with complete rawhide to the ground. He's got a flexible rawhide uh, uh, neck piece. His <coughs> face has got the you know, champ run out of rawhide. And the, the Indian riding it, it looks like he's in a canoe. I mean, total body armor. Uh, because it was before the firearm got there. Even the Apaches were making full body armor for their horses using glue and sand. They used fish scale armor. To, that's how valuable these animals were. I mean, we lose a good horse now and then, but to them, it was everything. Yeah. You, you know, and, and so, yes? How did the common sheriffs 
equate with the Pueblo Indians and the Comanches? <coughs> the Comanchero was a general name for, uh, and the governors were kind of behind it because every governor that came to New Mexico from, 15, from 1590s on paid for the permission. They paid a million bucks to become governor. So they figured they could get some float out of New Mexico, which they did. <laughs> Part of it was a hide trade. So the Comanchero were fairly brave people that would go out and seek uh, individual bands of, of, of Comanches in, in related Indians, Kiowa, whatever, uh, Lipan, and set up a bartering system with them to bring hides in. Later on, they would be replaced or would be co-current with Cibolaros, which was a, a occupation. Uh, they were buffalo hunters. They had a lance blade about this long. It was a one, they ran the buffalo, would run, run it into a buffalo's chest cavity, they, a, a buffalo has a unique situation where if you collapse one lung, the other's going to follow, falls on the heart, and they're going to go down. So you, have, you hit it like a whale with one harpoon, and then you go to the next. Uh, there's accounts of 40 to 50 tons of dry buffalo meat coming out with the common charos. So or, I'm coming out with the sebo arrows. So the sebo arrows and the common charos would sometimes take trade goods and do some hunting and all that kind of stuff. So there's, Thank you, Jim. Yeah, okay. But, <laughs> Jim, this is a wonderful... <laughs> well, I'm just old enough to start now. <laughs> you guys are fabulous. But I'm serious about the invite. Jeff, if you don't mind, I'm going to invite a person up here. Uh, Tom Henderson would like to make a presentation to you. Who? Tom Henderson. <laughs> Tom, what the heck? I don't even know you. <laughs> You know him afterwards. Jeff, what a what a treat! I tell you what, this just uh, this just goes along with uh, what sets us apart as the Bosque Memorial Museum to have people such as you, you here, and you have certainly topped the list. And um, also, I think we probably need to spend a little time with you about your fundraising techniques. <laughs> Pretty successful. <laughs> Strong arm. Yeah. But this is the end of a good week for Bosque County celebrates Texas independence. We've been yeah. doing this now for about nine years and, um, and coming up with, uh, with speakers to come and share with us uh, about history, Texas history. Thank you for being here and present you with the cap. Oh. <laughs> and it shows uh, the, one of the go. old flags, and this will tell you the story about that. I'm sure you may already know it, but anyway, and here's a, a oh PM for you very, very to not fun. forget us. Thank yeah. you very much. Come up and look at the and uh, if you would like, we have cookies, coffee, Yellow tea, rose water, water, whatever you would like. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And our next step is to expand our ex exhibition space right here in, in this facility. For the first time in the history of this museum, all exhibitions will now be uh, everything, excuse me, the only thing that this building will be will be an exhibition space as opposed to offices and the like. So we're making progress and we're very happy about that. We have a very busy spring. Keep your <laughs> eyes open. Uh, this is just uh, one event, but there are many more to come, including some representatives from the Smithsonian coming. Uh, uh, more about our um, uh, early man exhibit and that, that will be very, very important. Um, I am going to introduce uh, Chuck Loomis. He is a, a friend of a speaker and he knows him better certainly than I do. So without further ado, I'd like you to welcome with me Chuck Loomis. Well, we're here celebrating Texas independence and I think we really need to thank George and the museum staff.